Greetings, 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 greetings. Oh my God. Did you do it again? No, we're good to go. Okay. Greetings. This is King Clifford Jefferson. I send you the copy the fifth kind of Jew, son of folk, ruler of Jerusalem, the reincarnation of King Edgar the Peaceful, who you know as Jesus Christ. I'm here today. Uh, once again, with my Archbishop Belmont from the House of Belmont, here to give you another marvelous lesson on the true coronations and the origin of the coronation and where it truly stems from. I'd like to do this in honor of my queen, Sister Godwin from the House of Godwin, as well as on behalf of all our brothers and sisters, our elders, our children, as well as on behalf of our vast estate. Uh, with this, I'll digress. I'll let Archbishop say a couple of words and we get on with this marvelous lesson. Greetings again, brothers and sisters, uh, within the Kingdom of England, Empire of Albion, which is now known to be called Great Britain, uh, which in the British American colonies. Um, it is I, Archbishop Belmont, from the illustrious Noble House of Belmont. And like always, it is a great honor to be able to be here to do our due diligence to bring the consciousness back to our brothers and sisters who have been, um, been void of this information for quite some time. I'd like to also give honors to our King Clifford Jefferson, as well as Queen Godwinson, for their marvelous job in maintaining the integrity of the English people by doing their great work in the private um, to make sure that, you know, these courts can actually hear us and recognize us as being the people who is alive today. Um, the date is uh, May 6, 2973, which is our Berber calendar, equivalent to the 2023 Gregorian calendar, for those of you who have just now having their first uh, time opportunity to hear our voice and to see what it is that we were ordained to do and bring to the people this day and age. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and leave the rest of the introduction to our King and I digress. Well said, Archbishop Belmont from the House of Belmont. Once again, it's I, your King, King Clifford Jefferson, descended from the crown of the Plantagenet. We know that the history in regards to the crown is pretty much obscured, but we're going to try to give you uh, a more concrete understanding than what you have today. Uh, I hope you are familiar that today is May 6th, uh, 2023, as in the verb year 2973. But today, May 6th is a very important day because it was actually the day where the actual great Bible uh, created uh, under the auspices of the House of Tudors that were published around the world. And um, we're gonna start this lecture by that. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna try to move fast so that our time won't elapse. Um, but as you can see, all those who did the coronation, um, a lot of them are yelling that, you know, Charles II, III is not their king. This is what they're talking about. Charles III is not their king. And they're also asking for removal of the monarchy or the parliament and asking for a constitutional government or a republic what we have here now. So what you're actually seeing is a reversal in roles or a transition in role or a demise in role as we wrote as a result of what we call the interrect. So without further ado, let's get started. Let me just type in May slips. One second, I'll be with y'all in a minute. This is the Wikipedia. As we say, Wikipedia for us is baby food. Baby food, you know, we need baby food to grow, you know. Uh, it's a part of our process, you know, so that's my job to give it to you. Hopefully we won't have any problems with our screen or with this display. Uh, but if it does, forgive us. Uh, this lesson is very uh, important. And of course, the ethers, uh, the, or I should say the negative ethers, will, don't, will, don't want to allow this to come forth. But, you know, uh, the grace of our ancestors, it will allow it to be fruitful. All right, so let's, let's see. We see. 
May 6, 1541, King Henry VIII orders the England English language Bible be placed in every church. In 1539, the Great Bible will provide provided for this purpose. Okay? You got the uh, the Great Bible, you got the Bishop Bible, you got the uh, Wycliffe Bible, you got the William, William Tinsdale, you got the uh, King James Bible, you know, and all these were the result of what took place through what we call the House of Tudors, or the Reformation of the English Church, which Charles III is supreme governor of, okay? So May 6th, the coronation of King Charles III was a result of what was established by what we call the House of Tudors. The House of Tudors is symbol or symbolic heraldry is what we call the Red Rose. Very, 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 very important. Archbishop, I'm gonna allow you to read. You read a little bit more fluent than I do. Okay. Uh, we can probably move to it a little quicker. But this is the article from Westminster Abbey, the same place where the coronation is, is is happening at Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is in a city called Westminster, which is not far from London, the city of London, which is the capital city for the Kingdom of England, now called Great Britain. Uh, and then became what we call the United Kingdom due to, to what we call the, um, uh, the the unification of the crowns, okay? Uh, this is very important. Pay attention because all it has to do with the true coronation of Jesus Christ, who is none other than King Edgar the Peaceful. All right, Archbishop? Okay. The history of coronations, coronations at the Abbey. Westminster Abbey has been Britain's coronation church since 1066. King Charles III will be the fourth reigning monarch to be crowned in May 2023. Okay, which is today. The English coronation service proper was drawn up by St. Dustin, Archbury, excuse me, Archbishop of Canterbury, for the grand coronation of Edgar, first king of all England at Bath Abbey. Repeat that again. The English coronation service proper was drawn up by St. Dustin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for the grand coronation of Edgar, the first king of all England at Bath Abbey. The first king of all England at Bath Abbey. So let's get a clear indication of who this king is. King I mean, Edgar, king of England. One second, one second. Everybody see that? Let me share. Can you see that, Archbishop? Yes, King. This is King Edgar Jefferson, or King Edgar Godfrey. He's holding an orb and a scepter. He's wearing a crown. The same exact uh, uh, regalia that Charles III is using his uh, coronation. All right? Very, very, very important. All right. Read the early, early coronations. coronations. All right. Early coronations. The first documented coronation at Westminster was that of William the Conqueror on December 25th, 1066. Before this year, there had to be no fixed location for the ceremony. Edward the Confessor does not seem to have deliberately planned his new abbey as a coronation church. His immediate successor, Harold Godwinson, is likely to have been crowned here following the Confessor's death. 
but there is no surviving contemporary evidence to confirm the ceremony. William probably chose the Abbey for his coronation to reinforce his claim to be the legitimate successor of Edward. The Abbey's role as a coronation church influenced Henry III's rebuilding of the church in the Gothic style of architecture from AD 1245 in a large space or theater was planned under the lantern between the quarry and the high altar. The first king to be crowned in the present abbey was Edward I in 1274. That's cool. Son of Henry III, son of John, son of Henry II, son of Godfrey, the fifth kind of band Jew, were my surname to sit down from under what we call the Plantagenet. The Plantagenet, okay? So we know that the coronation that's taking place today, May 6th, May 6th, stems from the coronation, going back to the first coronation of King Edgar the Peaceful, which is to the English Church of England, is none other than King Edgar the Peaceful, who I look exactly like, who I am the reincarnation of. Why? Because I'm revealing this to you on this day. You see that, Archbishop? Yes, King. Supreme governor of the Church of England. This is what King Charles is. He's the supreme governor of the Church of England. Let's find out what that is. Read that, Archbishop. Okay. The supreme governor of the Church of England is the titular head of the Church of England, a position which is vested in the British monarch. Stop. It said a titular head of the Church of England. It did not say the English Church of England, and it also said the British Minarch. It didn't say Britain's Minarch or English Minarch. It said the British Minarch. So what is a titular? Read that. A titular ruler or the titular head is a person in an official position of leadership who possesses few, if any, actual powers. Sometimes a person may inhabit a position of titular leadership and yet exercise more power than would normally be expected as a result of their personality or experience. A titular ruler is not confined to political leadership, but can also reference any organization, such as a corporation. Okay, so this is what the ceremony represents today. Some individual or person sitting in a titular position under the head of the Church of England. And the authority that governs that transition of this incumbency is governed by the Act of Supremacy. Mm -hmm. This is the constituting instrument for the incumbency of King Charles III to claim to be King of England. The Act of Supremacy of 1558, which were from Queen Elizabeth I, the daughter of Henry VIII, okay? Let's just look that up, Supremacy Act. Read that form real quick, Archbishop. The Act of Supremacy 1558, uh, created during the reign of Elizabeth I, sometimes referred to the Act of Supremacy 1559 as an act of the Parliament of England, which replaced the original Act of Supremacy 1534 and passed under the auspices of Elizabeth I. The 1534 Act was issued by Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, which irrigated ecclesiastical authority to the monarchy, but which had been repealed by Mary I. Along with the Act of Uniformity 1558, the act made up what is generally referred to as the Elizabethan religious settlement. Okay. That was preceded by the Act of Supremacy of 1534. Let's get an idea of what that is. Read that for Mark Bishop. The Acts of Supremacy are two acts passed by the Parliament of England in the 16th century that established the English monarchs as the head of the Church of England. Two similar laws were passed by the Parliament of Ireland 
establishing the English monarchs as the head of the Church of Ireland. The 1534 Act declared King Henry VIII and his successors as the supreme head of the church, replacing the Pope. This first act was repealed during the reign of the Catholic Queen Mary I. The 1558 Act declared Queen Elizabeth I and her successors the supreme governor of the church, a title that the British monarch still holds. As you see what's going on today with the coronation of Charles III, all right? All of this stems from the act of supremacy, from Henry the, Elizabeth I to Henry VIII, from the House of Tudors, all right? under what we call the Supremacy Act. Okay. Now, they said he was the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. What is the Church of England? This is what we all need to know, because it's not the English Church of England. Everybody look at the box. The Church of England, classification, read the, read the breakdown, Archbishop. The yeah, classification is Protestant, it's orientation, Anglican. Theology, Anglican theology, excuse me, Anglican doctrine. Polity, Episcopal. The Supreme Governor, Charles III. Stop. Did they say King Charles III? No. It says Supreme Governor. In spite of what you see going on today, he's not the king of England. Mm -hmm. He's the supreme governor. He's just somebody sitting in that position, holding a position. He fits no other description but the word preside. The same position that your president holds. It's just a transition. What's going on right now? They're asking for a president. They're gonna get one. Why? Because the crown is originally here where it has always been. Continue on with the breakdown. The primate, Justin Welby, associations, Anglican communion, portable communion, World Council of Churches, the region, England, Wales, cross-border parishes, <clears throat> Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, continental Europe, and Morocco. That's the jurisdiction of where the, where the region that the Church of England covers. These are called overseas territories, possessions. For another word for that, it's called crown land. Okay, crown land, headquarters. This is your capital city. The headquarters is the capital city. city. The capital city is the, is, the, is the national capital of the country or state or the government. Okay, and who is this founder? Augustine of Canterbury. All right, and he got in him and, he, and who succeeded Augustine of Canterbury? Henry the Eighth. Okay, there you see the transition, everybody. You see the transition that was centered by Henry the Eighth through the reformation of the English Church of England by putting everything that belonged to the English in the trust. All right, we know Augustine of Canterbury was who? <clears throat> Augustine of Canterbury was the monk who probably, excuse me, was the monk who became the first Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 597. He is considered the apostle to the English and a founding figure of the Church of England. Augustine was a prior of a monastery in Rome where Pope Gregory the Great chose him in 595 to lead a mission usually known as the Gregorian Mission to Britain to Christianize King Ethelbert and his kingdom of Kent from Anglo-Saxon paganism. Stop. Okay, so everybody can read that on your own, but as you can see, the Church of England, not the English church, was established by the Roman Catholic Church under St. Augustine. All right? You go by their calendar today. Pope Gregory I uh, was the predecessor for Pope Gregory XIII, who created what we call the Gregorian calendar for the Gregorian mission that you're now subject to today. Everybody follow. We need to find out where does this come from? Where does the origin of the 
coronation stem from? Because we just said it goes back to King Edgar the Peaceful. And we know King Edgar the, Pe Edgar the Peaceful was the first king of England. The first king to actually wear a crown in England. All right? Let's get to the significance of it. So we did the acts of supremacy. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> Privy Council. We just for March fifth. Okay. The Privy Council of England, also known as his or her, depending on what the Queen is in, Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council, was a body of advisors to the Sovereign of the Kingdom of England. Its members were often senior members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons, together with leading churchmen, judges, diplomats, and military leaders. The Privy Council of England was a powerful institution advising the sovereign on the exercise of the royal prerogative and granting of royal charters. It issued executive orders known as orders in council and also had judicial functions. Okay. This is the Privy Council. This is the King's Court. His own personal council. All right. We know here in North America, uh, the, the founding fathers, before they got their start, they were ruled by the Privy Council of England. They were ruled by the Privy Council. Uh, read their name. Um, according to the Oxford Dictionary. Oh, I'm sorry, Archbishop. One second. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the definition of the word Privy and Privy Council is an obsolete one, meaning of or pertaining exclusively to a particular person or persons, one's own, insofar as the council was personal to the sovereign. During the reign of Elizabeth I, the council was recorded under the title, The Queen's Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council. Okay, just to get a little origin of what we call medieval, dark ages, how far it goes back to. The medieval council, during the reign of the House of Normandy, the English monarch was advised by Curia Regis, which consisted of magnates, clergy, and officers of the crown. This body originally concerned itself with advising the sovereign on legislation, administration, and justice. At certain times, the Curia was enlarged by general summons of magnates, the Great Council or Magnum Concilium in Latin. But as a smaller council, the Curia was in constant session and in direct contact with the king. Originally, important legal cases were heard, Cardum Regi, Latin for in the presence of the king himself. But the growth of the royal justice system under Henry II required specialization, and the judicial functions of the Curia Regis were delegated to two courts sitting at Westminster Hall, the Court of King's Bench and the Court of Common Pleas. Okay. Now, this is what we went by uh, back in the days of our ancestors called the Middle Ages. The king was accompanied by what we call the Privy Council, known as Magnum Concilium. Let's get a word, look at that word, Magnum Concilium. Read that for me. Right. Anglo Saxon predecessors. The origins of the Magnum Concilium, Latin for the Great Council, can it be traced to the 10th century when a unified kingdom of England was forged from several smaller kingdoms. In Anglo-Saxon England, the king would hold deliberative assemblies of nobles and prelates called Wittons. These assemblies numbered anywhere from 25 to hundreds of participants, including bishops, abbots, eldermen, and thanes. Wittons met regularly during the three feasts of Christmas, Easter, and Whitsun. And with other times, 
In the past, kings interacted with their nobility through royal itineration, but the new kingdom size made that impractical. Having nobles come to the king for Whitsons was an important alternative to maintain control of the realm. That's cool. So it says there are nobility through a royal itineration. A royal itineration. Now we just read from West Westminster the history of the origin of the coronation was done for King Edward the Peaceful. And he was corn on, on Whitsun. It's the day of Passover. This when he was crowned, May 11th, on Whit Sunday, or Whitsun, and Bath Abbey, the first King Edgar the Peaceful. Everybody needs to follow along. So now we're looking at the the, the Magnum Concilium, and it said the Magnum Concilium was the Privy Council that accompanied the king. So that meant that Charles II must have a Privy Council as well. All right, but we just said his his, his, his authorizing instrument come from the Supremacy Act of a queen that was was descended from another house. He's from the House of Windsor. Mm -hmm. He wasn't part of Great Britain. We had to treat that the Acts of Union of 1707. You had the Union of the Crowns in 1603. That's when King James got his start. All his authority came from the House of Tudors, which is represented by the Red Rose. The Red Rose of England. All right, look at all the symbols that's going down. So it says that the Privy Council was a royal itineration. So what is a royal itineration? Read that from Archbishop. A itinerant court was a migratory form of government common in European kingdoms in the early Middle Ages. Read that again for him. An itinerant court was a migratory form of government, common in European kingdoms in the early Middle Ages. It was an alternative to having a capital city, a permanent political center from which a kingdom was governed. Especially medieval Western Europe was characterized by political rule where the highest political authorities frequently changed their location bringing with them parts of the country's central government on their journey. Stop. Okay. So a itinerant court was an itinerant government or a migratory government. We know what migratory government means to journey, means to move. Mm -hmm. And it was an alternative to a capital city because the capital city is the central uh, 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 governing territory, which is the financial which is the legal, which is the historical uh, 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 sitting where everything functions from. It's the heart. Just to get a definition of capital city. Because we know a capital city in our ancestors' day uh, was an itinerant government. We know an itinerant government is a capital city on the move. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A capital city on the move. A moving capital city. All right, a moving government, capital city. Read that definition. A capital city or capital is the municipality holding primary status in a country, state, province, department, or other subnational entity, usually as its seat of the government. A capital is typically a city that physically encompasses the government's offices and meeting places. The status as capital is often designated by its law or constitution. In some jurisdictions, including several countries, different branches of government are in different settlements, sometimes meaning multiple official capitals. In some cases, a distinction is made between the official constitutional capital and the seat of government, which is in another place. Stop. <laughs> now, that's funny, because if you watch the coronation, Everybody's talking about away with the minor, away with the king. We want a constitution. That's what they said. We want a constitution. We want a republic. Okay. Well, if England, now called the United Kingdom, which was preceded, preceded by what was called Great Britain, and we know that the financial system center in the world for kingdom, Britain, or United Kingdom, whatever name you choose to call them, is a capital city. 
And the capital city is the municipality. You might have a lot of cities in the state come to your nation, but you only got one capital city. Mm -hmm. And if it's stemming from the origin where it comes from, it was in the tenement court held by the king, which they claim to be. But yet they're acting for a constitution. So now that questions the government now, because the government ain't where it's supposed to be, because Archbishop just said sometimes when it's a multiple official capital. In some cases, a distinction is made between the official constitutional capital and the seat of government, which is in another place. I'm going to show you that the seat of government for what they call England is not over there, it's right here. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to show you. Me and my previous council, we're going to show you right here. Okay, English language. Drop it from Archbishop. All right, the English language news media often use the name of the capital city as an alternative name for the government of the country of which it is the capital, as a form of metonymy. For example, relations between Washington and London refers to relations between the United States and the United Kingdom. Read that again. In the English language, news media often use the name of the capital city as an alternative name for the government of the country of which it is the capital, as a form of metonymy. For example, relations between Washington and London refers to relations between the United States and the United Kingdom. Read the Terminology and etymology. No, read the, it said refer to, yeah, he, oh, he read it. It said relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. So it says for the source, refer to relations between the United States and the United Kingdom. So before you do that, you got to deal with relationship between the United States and Great Britain. Before you deal with that, you got to deal with the United States relations between the Kingdom of England. And that take you back to time immemorial. Everybody needs to understand that. And it said, Washington is a metonym for London. And we know that London is the capital city for England, Great Britain, or the United Kingdom, which is the final financial center, as well as the government, as well as the uh, historical aspect for where the government I the capital city, because you just said news media, and all you see right now on news media is about that capital city, London. Mm -hmm. All right? So what is a metonym? Because that's what we need to find out. Metonymy. Read the etonymy. The etymology. The etymology of the word metonymy or metonym come from ancient Greek, a change of name from after, post, beyond, or it's a suffix that names figures of speech from or name. So as we can see, the, the etymology for the metonym for, uh, for as they refer to Washington, D.C. as London, means to change the name. A changed name, a new name, or misnomer. When you call something new, that means that it's never been in existence before. But if you rename something and call it New Jersey in its name after something else, that means that it's not, the, it's not new. You just gave it a new name. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody needs to understand that. Why do I say that? Because we're going back to um, the origin of uh, uh, the Privy Council. The Privy Council is the King's Council, and the King, the Privy Council, the King's Council was called the Magna Concilium, which was the Antinomic Court. And the Antinomic Court is a migratory government. Mm -hmm. Right? It's the capital city that's on the move. And we know that the capital city for uh, England or Great Britain, or what we call the United Kingdom, is London. Okay, very, 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 very important. And we're going to show you that it moved, the government moved from what they call London to here what we call North America. That's what we're going to prove to you today. That the government is here, not by some uh, somebody claiming supremacy over the Church of England, that don't mean you got supremacy because you claim it. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm speaking for both of the monarchs. Henry VIII and, and Queen Elizabeth, and everybody who was initiated under them. That don't make you king. Remember, parties may change, but positions don't. Positions don't. We know King Edgar was the first coronation, and that was based off the heroic tree. 
Let's prove it. Let's deal with the King's Council. Let's hear from Blackstone, because Blackstone wrote the commentaries on the laws of England. He was the Justice of the House of Commons, which is a part of the Privy Council. Let's just, let's just look at it again. Privy Council. Courts of the Common Pleas. Everybody see it. One of the justices was William Blackstone. Okay, let's go to his commentary. Chapter 5 of the Council Belonging to the King. Read this, Archbishop. All right. The third point of view in which we are to consider the king is with regard to his counsels. For in order to sense him the discharge of his duties, the maintenance of his dignity, and the exertion of his prerogative, the law hath assigned him a diversity of counsels to advise with. One. The first of these is the High Court of Parliament, whereof we have already treated at large. Two, secondly, the peers of the realm are by their birth hereditary counselors of the crown and may be called together by the king to impart their advice in all matters of importance to the realm, either in time of the parliament or which hath been their principal use when there is no parliament in being. Stop. Okay. So the first one is the courts. The second is it's the peers that can be called in parliament or outside of parliament. Out, when parliament is not in function, it's called an interregnum. When it's functionum and the transition is called a demise, transition of the prerogatives of the king. All right. And then we need the third one, the most important one. Read that. Hold on. Three. One second. All right. Three. A third council belonging to the king are, according to Sir Edward Coke, his judges of the courts of law for law matters. And this appears frequently in our statutes, particularly Edward III and in other books of law. So that when he, excuse me, during the reign of Edward III, his 14th year, and in other books of law, so that when a king's council was mentioned generally, it must be defined, particularized, and understood, segundum subjectum materium, and if the subject be of a legal nature, then by the king's council is understood his council for matters of law, namely his judges. Therefore, by, saying, uh, by statute of Richard II, in the 16th year of his reign, it was made a high offense to an important to his kingdom or this kingdom, any papal bull, uh, excuse me, any papal bullis or other processes from Rome. And it was enacted that the offenders should be attached by their bodies and brought before the king and his council to answer for such offense. Here, by the expression of the king's council, were understood the king's judges of his courts of justice, the subject matter being legal this being the general way of interpreting the word council. Okay. So as you can see in the coronation, you see one of those bishops wearing those mitre. And the mitre is one of those headdresses from the Roman Catholic Church. He performed the whole ceremony. When you watch the coronation, you will see that. And read four. In four. But the principal council belonging to the king is his privy council which is generally called by way of eminence, the council. And this, according to Sir Edward Coke's description of it, is a noble, honorable, and reverent assembly of the king, and such as he wills to be of his privy council in the king's court of palace. Stop. Okay. So there we see the king's council, his peers, and his judges. We see that. This is what Edward Coke was the judge that sat upon the house of, on the courts of common pleas. He was the justices. He was the head commentary on the laws of commentaries of England. All right. And he's dealing with the laws governing Privy Council. All right. Laws governing Privy Council. And we want to see that in law. We want we don't want to see it based off somebody claiming supremacy. 
We don't want to see that. We want to see it in law. Let's see it in law. All right. Because we know that the Privy Council, i.e., whether it was Correa Regis, a smaller council, or a bigger council, Magnum Concilium, we know that that was the intended court, means the King's Court, which means his Privy Council. The King's Bench. All right. Oh, before we go there, so let's get a look at this council. Oh, wow, can't believe I did that. Hold on. Let's look at this council. Council belonging to the king. A lot of us wonder, well, what are these eyes for? So let's click that because it says that a third point of view is which we are considered the king is regard to his council. For it is in order to assist him in his discharge of duty, the maintenance and his dignity, the exertion of the prerogatives the law has assigned to him a diversity of counsel to advise with. Uh, the law, everybody, the law has advised for him. The Constitution is the law. The mm -hmm. Constitution, a law, whether you're dealing with this uh, president, 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 presidential system of law or parliamentary system of law. The law has to ascribe to them counsel. All right. Who is the king's counsel? According to what William Blackstone said. Let's hit one. Read that, Archbishop. One. <clears throat> the president of the United States shall have power by and with the advice and the consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint an ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, judges of the Supreme Court and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not otherwise provided for by the Constitution. He may likewise require the opinion and writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. The heads of the different executive departments constitute the cabinet of the president. They are the secretaries of state, of the treasury, of war, of the navy, of the interior, the postmaster general, and the attorney general, Charles Ward. Key word, they constitute the cabinet. A cabinet is not a privy council, and a privy council is not a cabinet. Totally different. We just read privy council. And they say nothing about no cabinet, y'all. But William Blackstone, who sits on the uh, for the House of Commons, which is part of the King's bench, under the daughter of the King as part of the Privy Council, just said that uh, the president and his cabinet have their authority under what we call the executive powers or what we call the executive branch. Okay, let's review that because it's very important. Where did this term cabinet come from? You know it came from the United Kingdom. Read the first part, Archbishop, real quick. Okay. The cabinet of the United Kingdom is the senior decision-making body of His Majesty's government. The committee at the Privy Council it is chaired by the prime minister and its members include secretaries of state and other senior ministers. The ministerial code says that the business of the cabinet and cabinet committees is mainly questions of major issues of policy, questions of critical importance to the public and questions on which there is an unresolved argument between departments. Okay. Read the first paragraph. History, until at least the 16th century, Individual officers of state had separate property, powers, and responsibility granted with their separate offices by royal command, and the Crown and the Privy Council constituted the only coordinating authorities. In England, phrases such as cabinet council, meaning advice given in private, and a cabinet in the sense of a small room to the monarch, occur from the late 16th century and given the non-standardized spelling of the day. It is often hard to distinguish whether council... Yeah or counsel is meant. 
All right. Could you read a little bit louder too, Archbishop? Yep. Um, the OED credits Francis Bacon in his essays, 1605, with the first use of cabinet council. Uh, let me make sure I got it there. Right here. Okay, cabinet council, where it is described as a foreign habit of which he disproves or disapproves, for which inconveniences the doctrine of Italy and the practice of France in some king's time have introduced cabinet councils, a remedy worse than the disease. <laughs> <laughs> Charles I began a formal cabinet council from his accession in 1625 as his privy council or private council, and the first recorded use of cabinet by itself of such a body comes from 1644. And it is again hostile and associates the term with dubious foreign practices. Okay, so it's associated with foreign, with, with foreign dubious practice. It's not the Privy Council, but we know the Privy Council comes from the Magna Concilium, which is a great council. And we know that was the Tenement Court, the capital city, which is a moving government going back to time and memorial. All right? Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very important. Okay, so why do I say that? So th we know that the United Kingdom, which was ruled by the King Monarchs or the British Monarchs under King George II, first, second, and third, was dealing with uh, the, the 13 colonies when they separated by way of what we call yeah. their Declaration of Independence. Now, why is this important? Let's look at the cabinet of the United States. We know the cabinet of the United States then come into what we know the Constitutional Convention. And the Constitutional Convention was based off the Virginia Plan, the Jersey Plan, and the um, uh, Connecticut Compromise. The kind of Connecticut Compromise was created by Roger Sherman. The Jersey Plan was created by William Patterson. And the Virginia Plan was created by James Madison. All right. All these were considered your founding fathers who were all a part of the creation of this dawn constitution of 1787. I'm going to prove it to you. Now, this is the cabinet. And we know the cabinet is the electoral college. All these um, um, uh, presidents means to preside. That's all it meant to preside, to sit as the head. It didn't show you what position they had because there was no creation of a president prior to the creation of the 13 colonies, which were governed by a constitution. The first constitution of the United States in the states was the Constitution of July 2nd, 1776. All right. Cabinet. Read that, Archbishop. The Cabinet of the United States is the body consisting of the Vice President of the United States and the heads of the Executive Branch's Department in the Federal Government of the United States. It is the principal body advisory body to the President of the United States. Excuse me, is the Prince, let me reread that. It is the principal official advisory body to the President of the United States. The President chairs the meetings, but is not formally a member of the Cabinet. Stop. This is called the Opinion Clause. Because the Privy Council advises the king, but they swapped out for a Privy Council to a cabinet, which we know that was created by the United Kingdom, and the United States created, uh, uh, pre preceded, uh, were preceded by the United Kingdom. The only thing they changed was kingdom to states. That's the only thing they did was change the words states to kingdom. Because there was no kingdom prior to states, and we know states were colonies which were part of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. which is part of the, the British Empire, which originally came from the English Empire. All right? The heads of the departments... Sorry about that. Okay. Go ahead. No, skip that. Let's roll down here. The Constitution, right here. Okay. All right. The Constitution of the United States does not explicitly establish a cabinet. The cabinet's role inferred from the language of the opinion clause, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1 of the Constitution, is to provide advice to the president. Additionally, the 25th Amendment authorizes the vice president, together with the majority of the heads of the executive departments, to declare the president unable to discharge the powers and duties of, the, of his office. 
the heads of the executive departments are if eligible in the presidential line of succession. Okay. You had a you have the parliamentary uh system and presidential system. They they their successorship is due voting. It's not dealing with heroity, a line of successorship. Why? Because look at the history. The history will tell you. History. The tradition of the cabinet arose out of the debates at the 1787 Constitutional Convention regarding whether the president will exercise executive authority solely or collaboratively with the cabinet ministers or a privy council. Read that again. The tradition of the cabinet arose out of the debates at the 1787 Constitutional Convention regarding whether the president will exercise executive authority solely or collaboratively with the cabinet of ministers or a privy council. As a result of the debates, the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1, vests all executive power and the president singly and authorizes but does not compel the president, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1, to require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. The Constitution does not specify what the executive departments will be, how many there will be, or what their duties will be. George Washington, the first president of the United States, organized his principal officers into a cabinet, and it has been part of the executive branch structure ever since. Washington's cabinet consisted of five members, himself, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of War Henry Knox, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph. That's it. Okay, that's all we need to know. To know. The rest of y'all can read it on your own, but we know George Washington was the first president. And George Washington, after first president, was one of the founding fathers, and he was a part of the original cabinets who set up the cabinet for himself. And we know that they opt out because the Constitutional Convention was for that purpose. Now, this is from Wikipedia, but let's find a source to qualify that. The Heritage Guide of the Constitution. Everybody see that? This is 1787 Constitution. That's, this is, we're dealing with the executive branch. We're dealing with the executive powers of the president. All right, because he has a cabinet. He doesn't have a privy council. But what they just said, the convention, the Constitutional Convention, which was for the creation of a constitution, as a, was a result of the opting out for a privy council and uh, for uh, what we call a cabinet. Let's see right here. Article 2, Executive Branch. Opinion Clause. Read that for more, Bishop. Okay. The Opinion Clause, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. The President may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. The opinion clause arose out of the debates at the Constitutional Convention regarding whether the president will exercise executive authority singly or in concert with other, excuse me, in concert with other officials or privy counselors. A brief review of English custom illuminates the choices made by the framers. Formerly, parliamentary ministers were ministers to the king. In addition, all British citizens were subjects of the king, and the king could require any nobleman, judge, or member of parliament to serve in his privy council and provide him with personal or official advice. By the end of the 18th century, however, the ministerial offices had assumed such practical and administrative power that has diminished the king's responsibility for actions taken by the government. The king was increasingly expected to defer to his minister's decisions. The state of the English executive at the time of the framing was this. Legally, the king could do no wrong. Politically, the king was responsible for no administrative wrong. Okay. So now, this was in the United States government under the authority of the executive branch of 1787 in regards to the opinion clause. 
They opt out because they didn't want to deal with a parliamentary system of law. They wanted a presidential system of law by a staff to the cabinet because they inherited from a rump parliament. A rump parliament, a de facto parliament. Now let's see where this got. Let's look at the authors of this document. Was George Washington was the president, all right, from Virginia delegates, the House of Burgers. That was the, that was the government or the migratory government or the interior government at function at that time. We're going to prove it to you. We ain't just talking. We're going to prove it. You see George Washington there. You see John Dickerson. He, he's the one who presented the petition to the king, which was denied by King George III. You had who? Daniel Carroll. Daniel Carroll was the brother of uh, what's his name? John Carroll, the first uh, 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 what we call um, white car for the Roman Catholic Church here in North America. James Madison, the Virginia plan. Who else? Roger Sherman, the Connecticut Compromise, the one they chose. Mm. Alexander Hamilton. William Livingston, he overthrew William Franklin, the last world governor. Who succeeded William Livingston? William Patterson. William Patterson. He's right here, too. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin. Come on. Y'all got to see the, the treasonous act that was committed by these very people who so called say they found the father, who founded the United States. Because a part of the United States, you had the United States is actually 13 colonies. The United States is actually 13 colonies, and the Constitution for the 13 colonies is the original Constitution. And we know we're in New Jersey, and New Jersey's Constitution was drafted July 2nd, 1776. Now, let's look at the language of the Constitution in regards to that council that we're talking about that advised the king versus the cabinet that advises the president. William Patterson, secretary, Samuel Tucker. He's the president of this of the uh, of this of, of this committee at this particular time. This is the 1776 Constitution of New Jersey. You see it right here. We're gonna scroll down to Article 8. Read that from Archbishop. Before, okay. Before we go, read five. Start from five. But we're talking about the Privy Council, the one that the king takes uh, uh, advice from or, or get, gets opinion from. Now they pass this to the presiding governor, who was the president. Now they added that convention or quorum, they created a whole new president, which really don't even exist, because the true president or the presiding president was the governor, because the governor uh, at the time of the crown on crown land was the royal governor. Mm -hmm. All right. Read five. Five, uh, five, or clause five, that the assembly, when the met, shall have power to choose a speaker and other their officers to be judges of the qualifications and elections of their own members, sit upon their own adjournments, prepare bills to be passed into laws, and to empower their speaker to convene them whenever any extraordinary occurrence shall render it necessary. Okay. Uh, clause six, that the council shall also have the power to prepare bills to pass into laws and have other like powers as the assembly and in all respects be a free and independent branch of the legislature of this colony, save only that they shall not prepare or alter any bill, excuse me, any money bill, which shall be the privilege of the assembly and the council shall from time to time be convened by the governor or vice president, but must be convened at all times. When the assembly sits, for which purpose the Speaker of the House of Assembly shall always, immediately after an adjournment, give notice to the governor or vice president of the time and place to which the House is adjourned. Clause 7, that the council and assembly jointly at their first meeting after each annual election shall by a majority of votes elect some fit person within the colony 
to be the governor for one year, who shall be constant president of the council and have a casting vote in their proceedings, and that the council themselves shall choose a vice president who shall act as such in the absence of the governor. Stop. Okay, so you just read the legislative, now they're going to the executive part, uh, aspects of it. And they're talking about the same term president as far as the position, how he's going to act as head of the board, but he's a governor. He's the governor who's going to either be the president or the vice president. And they're going to go into his executive duty. Read section eight. Clause eight, that the governor, or in his absence, the vice president of the council shall have the supreme executive power, be chancellor of the colony, and act as captain general and commander in chief of all of the militias and other military force in this colony, and that any three or more of the council shall at all times be a privy council to consult them and that the governor be extraordinary, excuse me, and that the governor be ordinary or surrogate general. Okay, so we know it didn't say nothing about no cabinet. It said privy council. Then we go back to privy council. We know that the privy council was called the Magnum Concilium. And the Magnum Concilium was called uh, an itinerary court. And an itinerary court is a moving court. And a moving court is a, 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 what we call a capital city, right here. Mm -hmm. A tenure court is called a capital city. And we know that Washington, D.C. was a metonym for London. Okay? We know that you didn't have a Washington, D.C. if you didn't have a London, because when, when, when so-called America was colonized by the 13 colonies, this still was called America. It was called British America. Prior to that was called the British Empire, and part of the, prior to that was called the English Empire. So America has always been here. It was not occupied by those settlers, which are those 13 colonies, which takes you back into the original reason for the Union. Unus, what is called, um, uh, uh, Unus, what's called, out of many comes one. What's that uh, Latin verse? Um. Uh, on the dollar bill, I said unum pluribus. Uh, unum, unum. Yeah. Many comes one. Pluribus unum. Yeah. Okay. So we know that the original Constitution, July second, seventeen seventy six, said a privy council. And we know the privy council was the one who uh, who um, assisted the king in his travels. All right. Versus a cabinet that was established in the sixteenth century by Charles the first. Charles the first was descended from King James as assumed to be King of England, which he was not. Okay, why do I say all this? Why? Let's bring it home. London Company. Mm -hmm. The London Company or the Virginia Company? We already know that London is the capital city. The capital city of London is the financial center as well as the government for which the corporations, i.e. companies, do business on behalf of London, which brings us into the, what we call the London Company. And the London Company is also called the Virginia Company of London. All right? And this is the territory that they accomplish, which is the 13 colonies. All right? Under what we call a migratory government or an itinerant government or itinerant court under the King's Council. We've seen it right there under constitutional law, under the Constitution of New Jersey, and we know the Constitution of Jersey is the practice of the common law of England. Where is it at? Article 22. Read that form, Archbishop. Okay. Hold on, I'm sorry. Article 22. Can they say it or can you say it? Oh, there we go. Article 22, that the common law of England, as well as so much of the statute law, as have been heretofore practiced in this colony, should still remain in force until they shall be altered by a future law of the legislator. Such parts only accepted as are repugnant to the rights and privileges contained in this charter, and that the inestimable right of trial by jury shall remain confirmed as a part of the law of this colony without repeal forever. 
Okay. And and that's only uh, uh, based upon this, what we call uh, our preclusion clause. What it says right here. It says, provided always, and it is the true intent and the meaning of this Congress that if a reconciliation between Great Britain and these colonies shall take place, and the latter be taken again under the protection and government of the crown of Britain, this charter shall be null and void, otherwise to remain firm and inviolable. Okay, and who was the secretary at this time? William Patterson. William Patterson, William Patterson was the signer of the 1787 Constitution for the, for the United States Congress, for New Jersey, right here. Mm -hmm. William Livingston was the one who was there before him who replaced William Franklin, illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin, who established the Albany Congress. The Albany Congress was replaced by the Stamp Congress. The Stamp Congress came as a result of what we call the Stamp Act of 1765. The Stamp Act, Stamp Act of 1765 resulted in the, its appeal, but the creation of what we call the Declaratory, the, uh, the Declaratory Act of 1766, which declared that the American colonies of the 13 colonies were subject of Great Britain and that Great Britain under parliamentary law can deal with the American colony as well as the people as they saw fit. That's the Declaratory Act, all right? Let's come here. Okay, so we know that the London Company, which is the 13 colonies, was a company uh, that was being funded from England and in and, and, and the capital city called London. The headquarters was in London. Everybody see that? London, England. But the area and the jurisdiction that the laws governing England, now at this time called Great Britain, uh, uh, transferred all the way over here. From the capital city of London, now they created a jurisdiction where the laws applied here, from that capital city. Not because that's where the central seat of government was, that the, the, the central government was moving. So it moved from over there. And it moved over here to the Virginia coast. I don't want to believe that. I believe it was always here. But if they want to come create that story, we're going to show you that the government or the tenement court or the movable government or the migratory government migrated over here. And that government was under the crown because we know that that government was called the British Empire. And today, the British Empire is the British Empire in the world, biggest empire in the world. All right. So we know that the London Company and the British Company main company or headquarters was in London, England. So let's go to London. We know that London, everybody claimed that's London, but it's not actually London. Read the first paragraph on March the 6th. All right. London. <clears throat> London is the capital and the largest city of England and the United and now the United Kingdom, with a population of just under 9 million. It stands on the River Thames in southeast England at the head of a 50-mile history down to the North Sea and has been a major settlement for two millennia. The city of London, its ancient core and financial center, was so-called founded by the Romans as Londinium, and it retains its medieval boundaries. Stop. Okay. So the city of London or London where the capital city or the business center or financial center of London, they claimed that was inhabited by Romans called Londinium. That story was not true. It was created by Godfrey of Mama. All right. There's no proof to that story. And Rome is not in England. Mm -hmm. uh, and England is not a part of Europe, the continent of Europe. The London or the city of London was the creation of 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 um uh to do business the term was created for to do business in regards to the financial system governing that that government at that particular time so at this time England as they say financial uh system was governing the city of London so let's look at the city of London let's go let's get a bigger understanding of the city of London because we know London got a lot of cities England got a lot of cities but there's only one capital city in England or Great Britain or United Kingdom that is the capital city, and that's the city of London. 
Let's click that. Before we do that, let's go back here. The Virginia company, back to the Virginia company or London company. So the London company or the Virginia company are actually companies of the same uh, heck, uh, uh, mother company or the parent company, which is the London company, all right, or the London corporation. All right, so we've got London company and the Virginia company. Here's the Virginia company. Everybody see it. Read the first paragraph, Archbishop. All right. <clears throat> the Virginia Company was, was an English trading company chartered by King James I on April 10, 1606, with the object of colonizing the eastern coast of America. The coast was named Virginia after Elizabeth I, and it stretched from present-day Maine to the Carolinas. The company's shareholders were Londoners, and it was distinguished from the Plymouth Company, which was chartered at the same time and composed largely of gentlemen from Plymouth, England. Stop. So they just said London or the capital city of London was the financial city of the world. And the people who was coming over here to do business for London, they clearly just said were shareholders. And you know what a shareholder is? Somebody who makes up or gets the capital once all the debts is paid from the so-called uh, 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 assets that they so-called have. So it says the company shareholders were called Londoners. So I mean, if they're Londoners, that means they must have been from London. And that'll take you right there to London. And we know London is the largest capital city and the financial city for England, Great Britain, or what we call the United Kingdom. I guess that's how they pay for that correlation. Right. So we see the city of London. So let's get back into the city of London, because as we see, the London Company or the Virginia Company, which were trade companies doing business on behalf of the London Company, because the city of London is a company. They brought their proof. It was it was chartered in 2006. All right. It was chartered in 2006. Don't ask me. Let's just go to the stores. City of London. City of London. Right to the box. City London is the city ceremony of county local government district that contains the historic center in Katu alone, Carry Walk, the primary central business district of London. All right. It says right here, what does it say right here in the model? Model, uh, City of London Corporation. Let's find out what that is. Read that, Archbishop. City of London Corporation. One second, let me find it. All right, the City of London Corporation officially and legally the mayor and commonalty and citizens of the City of London is the municipal governing body of the City of London. The historic center of London and the location of much of the United Kingdom's financial sector. Everybody hear that? The city of London is a corporation officially and legally, legally the mayor of the commonality and citizens of the city of London, because most of the uh, encounters that you have with your government is in the city. And your city is headed by who? The mayor. It's headed by the mayor. All right, now let's get into the history of the city of London, because we know the city of London is the capital city for the financial a uh, country of England, now called Great Britain, now called United Kingdom. Okay? And we know that there were the, the 13 colonies over here, called the Virginia Company or the London Company, were shareholders of that big corporation called the City of London Corporation. So where does it get its authority from? Let's find out. History. Right. History. In the Anglo-Saxon period, consultation between the city's rulers and its citizens took place at the folk moot. Administration and judicial processes were conducted at the court of Husting, 
and the administrative part of the court's work evolved into the Court of Aldermen. There is no surviving record of a charter first establishing the corporation as a legal body, but the city is regarded as incorporated by prescription, meaning that the law presumes it to have been incorporated because it has for so long been regarded as such. Example, the Magna Carta states that the city of London shall have and enjoy its ancient liberties. The city of London corporation has been granted various special privileges since the Norman Conquest and the corporation's first recorded royal charter dates from around 1067, when William the Conqueror granted the citizens of London a charter confirming the rights and privileges that they had enjoyed since the time of Edward the Confessor. Numerous subsequent royal charters over the centuries confirmed and extended the citizens' rights. Okay, so in full circle, that the city of London, the financial center for England, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, which is now over here. Why? Because it's an itinerant government, a moving government under what we call a capital city. And the capital city is governed by its laws, which we know with the Constitution. And the Constitution sets the standard for the government created by the legislation and, and executed by the executive branch, which we know in the Constitution of New Jersey, it says Privy Council. And we went to the origin of the Privy Council, Council which is the Magna Concilium or Career Region, which means it's a moving co court or itinerant court. And we know that that's composed of the king's peers. And we know that that was qualified by William Blackstone in his commentary. In his commentary. And it said that this in Elivo, substantial heroic wife is confirmed by William the Conqueror who took over England. And he got it from who? Ever to Confessor. And guess who William Ever to Confessor the son of? At the Red the Unready. And who was his father? King Edgar the Peaceful. King Edgar the Peaceful. Ethelred was the son of King Edgar the Peaceful and Queen Elspeth. Okay? Edgar the Peaceful. This is King Edgar the Peaceful. This gentleman who looks exactly like me. Looks exactly like me. And I confirm it as a result of what was stated in the history of the coronation, as it said right here, the English coronation service proper was drawn up by St. Dustin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for the grand coronation of Edgar, first king of all England at Bath Abbey. And in closing, we already seen July 2nd, 1776 Constitution speaks about the Privy Council. Article 8 and Article 22 talks about, speaks about the common law of England and that if a reconciliation with Great Britain ever took place, that that constitution will be null and void. And we know that's null and void because of this statute. Read this from Archbishop in closing. Uh, New Jersey Revised Statute 46 colon 3 dash 2. Certain tenures and holdings turned into free and common soakage. The tenures of honors, manors, lands, tenements, or hereditaments, or of estates of inheritance at the common law, which is the common law of England, held either of the King of England or of any other person or body politic or corporate at any time before July 4th, 
1776 and declared by Section 3 of an act entitled An Act Concerning Tenures, passed February 18, 1795, to be turned into holdings by free and common soakage from the time of their creation and forever thereafter shall continue to be held in free and common soakage. This charge of all the tenures, charges, and incidents enumerated in said section three. Okay, so as you can see, the common law or the customary law that's validated by the constitution of July 2nd, 1776, because it said July 4th, 17, uh, 1776. So you declared your independence July 2nd, but it didn't come into effect until July 4th. And just told you prior to that declaration, everything that you declare is null and void because the land belongs back to the King of England. So if that's the case, how could the coronation be going on today for Charles III claim to be King of England? He cannot be King of England because there's no statutory law. There's no constitution to support that. There's no common law to support that because the only law they got is that of which was created by way of the Supremacy Act to claim um, uh, supremacy over the Church of England. And this is not that church. This is the English Church of England, and the coronation of the English Church of England go back to King of the people, which I'm reincarnation of. Uh, so with that, I digress. I believe all closed remarks are Bishop Belmont and House of Belmont. With, with that, I say peace. Well, well there you have it, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, another marvelous lesson to verify and to show you the origins of the coronation, which was done by the first King of England, uh, King Edgar the Peaceful. Um, and as you notice, what is going on now today is that there has been or there is going to be an interregnum uh, regarding now you see Charles III, who was nothing more than a titular figure for the Church of England, which is run and headed by the Roman Catholic Church. So there's a complete separation or there's a complete distinction between the, what is the Church of England and what is the English Church of England, because now you see that we have been mixed up. And we have been placed into a place of bondage based off of this confusion. But now that the king has come to reveal what it is that many of us need to see within the British American colonies is that this is England. The United States itself is England. The laws, the rights, prerogatives of the king of England has been solidified and codified in modern day statutes today because they knew the day was going to come that the king was going to figure out who he was because he was born at the right specific time for him to come and do this great work. So Before that we go, let me just show him something. In closing. So yes. I'm not just on, on the platform. I'm doing business. I'm doing war in the in the courtroom. That's why we say, brothers and sisters, you know, right now you're dealing with a time with a lot of confusion is taking place. And uh, we need to know who is who. So if you don't know who you are, we highly recommend you to actually start doing your research regarding your ancestry and your lineal descent. Because only that will prove to you without a shadow of a doubt who you are without having to go through the filters or the blinders of foreign occupiers who don't want you to be yourself. Mm -hmm. And this foreign invasion has been taking place going all the way back in 1066 when William the Conqueror came in and brought feudalism into the kingdom of England. And William the Conqueror, he was a melanated man who looked just like us. Same way as your so-called founding fathers. They all was melanated people. So this is a, a war that we have been fighting against ourselves. And the only way for us to be able to fix it, we've got to use love. We have to love our brothers and sisters again like we love ourselves, and like I said, and love the truth. So therefore that we can inherit the kingdom of England, which is, we can call planet Albion back. Well said, Archbishop. And I just want to show y'all that I'm about my father. We are about our father's business. As you can see, all these are live cases. Jefferson versus the city of New Brunswick. All right. Jefferson versus the state of New Jersey. 
Jefferson versus LP Home, Je uh, Jefferson versus Trent. These are all on behalf of King Clifford Jefferson, on behalf of our people, the English people. All right, so I'm about my father's business, and my father's business is about saving my people. So with that, I greet you as I meet you in peace and love. Peace and love. Recording. Gotta stop it recording. I'm trying to find it now. Stop. Did I stop it? <clears throat> no, not yet. Right at the button where it says record, it should give you the option to stop it. Give me.